Sword Art Online Progressive Written by Reiki Kawahara Read by May Zarita 1. Just once, I saw an actual shooting star. It wasn't on a camping trip under the stars, but from my bedroom window. This wouldn't be such a rare thing to those who live in places with clear skies, or that are properly dark at night. But my home of 14 years, Kawago and Saitama Prefecture, was neither of those things. Even on a clear night, you could only see the brightest of stars with the naked eye. But one midwinter night, I just so happened to glance out of the window and caught a glimpse of a momentary brilliance falling vertically through the starless night sky pale with the light of the city. I was in the fourth or fifth grade at the time, and in my innocent youth I decided to make a wish, only to squander it on the most pointless of things imaginable. I wish the next monster would drop a rare item. I was in the middle of grinding for a level up in my favorite MMORPG at the time. I saw another shooting star of the same color and speed three or perhaps four years later, but this was not with the naked eye, and it did not flash against the gray night sky. It happened within the murky depths of a labyrinth created by the Nerve Gear, the world's first sensory immersive VR interface. The way the fenster fought brought the word possessed to my mind. He darted out of the way of the level 6 ruined kobold trooper, crude axe so tightly I felt a chill run down my back. After three successful evasions, the kobold's balance was entirely lost, and he unleashed a full power sword skill into the helpless beast. He used linear. A simple thrust that was the first attack of anyone who learned in the rapier category. It was very ordinary attack, a twisting thrust straight forward from a centered position. But his speed was astonishing. It was clear not just the game's motion assistance systems at work, but rather the product of his own athletic skill. I'd seen party members and enemy monsters use the same skill countless times during the beta test, but all I could catch this time was the visual effect of the sword's trajectory, not a glimpse of the blade itself. A sudden flash of pure light in the midst of a dim dungeon brought the memory of a shooting star back into my mind. After three repetitions of the same pattern, of dodging the kobold's combo and responding with linear, the fencer had dispatched the armed creature, one of the most toughest in the dungeon, without taking a scratch. But it was not a lazy, easy battle. Once the final thrust had ripped through the kobold's chest and sent it bursting into empty polygonal shards, he stumbled back and thudded against the wall as though the creature disintegrated had pushed him backwards. The man slid down the wall until he sat on the floor, breathing heavily. He hadn't noticed me standing at the tunnel intersection about 15 yards away. My normal activity at this point would be to, would be to silently slink away and find my own prey to hunt. Ever since I'd make my own decisions one month ago to work as a self-interested solo player, I had never gone out of my way to approach another person. The only exception would be if I saw someone battling in mortal danger, but the fencer had never dipped below full health. At the very least, he didn't seem to need anyone barging in and offering to help. But still, I hesitated for five seconds and then made up my mind to strode forward in the direction of the sitting player. He was skinny undersized, wearing a light bronze breastplate over a red tunic, tight-fitting leather pants, and knee-high boots. His face was hidden beneath the hooded cape that hung from head to waist. Everything aside from the cape was proper light armor for a nimble fencer, but it was also similar to my swordsman's wear. 
my beloved Anil Blade, a reward for a high-level quest, was so heavy that I needed to cut down on both the equipment to keep my moves sharp. I didn't wear anything heavier than a dark gray leather coat and a small breastplate. The fencer flinched when he heard my footsteps, but didn't move farther. He would have seen the green color on my cursor to reassure him that I was no monster. His head stayed hung between his upturned knees, a clear sign that he wanted me to keep walking. But I stopped a few feet away. A bit overkill, if you ask me. The slender soldiers under the thick cape shrugged again. The hood shifted back just an inch or two, and I saw two sharp eyes glaring at me. All I could see were two light brown irises. The contours of his face were still shadowed. After several seconds of a glare, just as piercing as those rapier thrusts, he tilted his head slightly to the side. It seemed to suggest that he didn't understand what I meant. Inwardly, I heaved a heavy sigh of resignation. There was one massive itch on my back of my mind that kept me from continuing my solitary way. Not only were the pre- and post-motions extremely brief, the attack itself was faster than I could see. I've never been in the presence of such a terrifying and beautiful sword skill before. At first, I assumed he must have been another form of beta tester. That speed had to come from plenty of experience gained before this world had plugged into its current deadly state. But when I saw that linear for a second time, I began to question my assumption. In comparison to the excellence of his attack, the fencer's battle flow was downright perilous. Yes, the defensive strategy of dodging enemy strikes with a minimum of movement led to quicker counter-strikes than blocking or parrying, as well as saving wear and tear on equipment. But the consequences of failure far outweighed those positives. In a worst-case scenario, a successful hit by the enemy might be treated as a counter-attack. That included a brief stun effect. For a solo fighter, getting stunned was a kiss of death. It didn't add up. Brilliant swordplay combined with downright reckless strategy. I wanted to know why, so I approached and wondered out loud if it might be overkill. He didn't under even understand that extremely common online term. The fencer sitting on the floor here could not be a beta tester. He might not even be an MMO player before coming to this game. I took a quick breath and launched into an explanation. Overkill is a term used when you do way too much damage for the amount of health the monster has left. After your second linear, the kobold was nearly dead. It only had a two or three pixels left on its HP bar. You could have finished it off easily with a light attack, rather than going for a full sword skill. How many days had it been since I'd said so many words at once? How many weeks? For being a poor Japanese student, my explanation was as elegant as an essay, but the fencer showed no response for a full ten seconds. Finally, a soft voice muttered from the depths of the hood. Is there a problem with doing too much damage? Finally, at long last, I realized the squatting fencer was the rarest of encounters in the entire world. To say nothing of a deep dungeon. Not a male player, but a woman. The world's first VR MMO. RPG, Sword Art Online, had opened its virtual doors nearly a month before. In your average MMO, players would be hitting the initial level cap of the entire game world would have been thoroughly explored from end to end. But here, in SAO, even the best players in the game were barely around level 10. And no one knew what the cap was. Barely a few percent of the game's setting, the floating castle Einkrad had been mapped out. 
SAO was not quite a game anymore. It was more of a prison. Logging out was impossible, and death of the player's avatar resulted in death of the player's body. Period. Under those stark circumstances, few people dared risk the danger of a dungeon's monsters and traps. On top of that, the game master forced every player's avatar into their real-life gender, which meant there was a massive shortage of female players in the game. I'd assumed that most of them were still camped out in the safe haven of the Town of Beginnings. I'd only spotted women two or three times in this massive dungeon, the first floor labyrinth, and they were all in the midst of large adventuring parties. Thus, it never occurred to me that in a solitary fencer at the edge of the unexplored territory deep in the dungeon might actually be a woman. I briefly considered mumbling an apology and leaving in a haste. I wasn't on a crusade against the men who always made a point to talk to any female player they saw without hesitation, but I most definitely did not want to be identified as one of them. If she'd responded with a uh, mind your own beeswax, or I can do whatever I want, I'd have no choice but to agree and move along. But the fencer's response seemed to be an honest question, so I stopped and tried to come up with a proper explanation. Well, there's no penalty in the game for overkilling, it's just inefficient. Sword skills take a lot of concentration, so the more you use them, the more exhausted you get. I mean... You'll still get back home, right? You should try to conserve energy. Get back home? The voice from the hood questioned again. It was a ragged monotone and seemingly exhausted. But I thought it was beautiful. I didn't say it out loud, of course. Instead, I tried to elaborate. Yeah, it's going to take a good hour to get out of the labyrinth from this spot. And even the closest town is a 30 minutes away from here, right? You'll make more mistakes when you're tired. You look like a solo player to me. Those mistakes can easily turn fatal. As I spoke, I wondered to myself why I was lecturing her so earnestly. It wasn't because she was a girl, I thought. I'd started this conversation before realizing her gender. If the roles were reversed and someone had hauntingly lectured me about what I should do, I'd certainly tell them to go to hell. Once I realized how contradictory my actions were to my personality, Fencer finally reacted. In that case, there's no problem. I'm not going home. Oh, uh, you're not going back into town? But what about a refill on potions, repairing equipment, g getting sleep? I asked incredulously. She shrugged briefly. Don't need potions if I don't take damage. I brought five of the same sword. If I need to sleep, I just get to a nearby safe area. She said hoarsely. I had no response. The safe area was a small room located inside the dungeon that was never in danger of spawning any monsters. It was easily distinguished by its colored torches in each corner of the room. They were useful as a foothold when hunting and mapping out a dungeon, but they weren't meant for more than an hour-long nap. The rooms had no beds, only hard stone floors, and open doorways that didn't keep out incessant sounds of monstrous footsteps and growling in the corridor outside. Even the stoutest adventurers couldn't get honest sleep under such conditions. But if I was to take her statement as face value, she was at a cramped stone chamber as a replacement for a proper in-room in order to camp out permanently inside the dungeon. Could that possibly be right? Um, how many hours have you been in here? I asked, afraid to know the answer. She exhaled slowly. Three days, maybe four. Are you done? The next monster is going to spawn soon, so I need to get moving. She put a fragile, gloved hand against the dungeon wall and unsettlingly climbed to her feet. With the rapier dangling from her hand as heavily as a two-handed sword, 
She turned her back to me. As she walked forward, I saw ragged tears in the cape that spoke to its poor condition. In fact, it was a miracle that after four days of camping out in a dungeon, the Fimsley cloth was attached at all. Perhaps her statement about not taking any damage was an idle boast. Even I didn't expect the words that tumbled out of my mouth at her receding back. If you keep fighting like this, you're going to die. She stopped still and let her right shoulder rest against the wall before turning around. The eyes I'd thought were hazel under that hood now seemed to flash a pale, piercing red. We're all going to die anyway. Her hoarse, cracking voice seemed to deepen the chill in the air of the dungeon. Two thousand people died in a single month. And we haven't even finished the first floor. There's no way to beat this game. The only difference is when and where you die. Sooner. Or later. The longest and the most emotional statement she'd utter so far. Passing her lips hung in the air. I instinctively took a step forward. Then watched as she quietly crashed on the floor. As though hit by invisible Paralysis. Two. The moment she hit the floor, the only thought that passed through her brain was the mundane question. I wonder what happens when you pass out in virtual world. Falling unconscious was a momentary shutdown of the brain, caused by stoppage of blood flow. Blood might stop flowing for a variety of reasons. Heart or blood vessels malfunctions, anemia, low blood pressure, hyperventilation. But under a VR full dive, the physical body was already utterly stationary in a bed or reclining area. On top of that, everyone stuck in this particular game of death had presumably been transferred a, to a nearby medical facility where they'd undergoing regular monitoring and administering of necessary drugs and fluids. It was hard to imagine someone passing out from purely physical reasons. These thoughts ran through her fading conscious and eventually coalesced into a simple statement. I just don't care anymore. Nothing mattered. She was going to die here. If she passed out in the middle of a labyrinth, guarded by deadly monsters, there was no way she had emerged safely. There was another player nearby, but she wouldn't risk her own life just to save a stranger. Besides, how would he save her? The weight a player could carry in this virtual world was strictly controlled by the game's system. Deep in a dangerous dungeon like this, any player would be heavily laden with potions and emergency supplies not to mention all their loot that they produced along the way. It was impossible to imagine anyone carrying another human being on top of all that. Then she realized something. For fleeting thoughts escaping her brain, just she fell unconscious. There were certainly lasting quite while. Plus, it was only hard stone beneath her body, so why did she feel this warm, soft thing and gentle pressing against her back. She felt warm somehow. There was even a light breeze tickling her cheek. With a start, her eyes snapped open. She wasn't in a dark dungeon surrounded by clammy stone walls. It was a clearing in the midst of a forest surrounded by ancient trees engraved with golden moss and thorny bushes bearing small flowers. She passed out, no, been sleeping, on a bed of grass as soft as carpet in the middle of a round clearing, measuring roughly eight yards across. But how? She'd lost consciousness deep in that dungeon, so how could she have traveled all the way to this outdoor area? The answer was 90 degrees to her right. There was a gray shadow huddled at the foot of an especially large tree, at the edge of the open space. He cradled a large sword with both his hands and 
had his head resting on the scabbard. His face was hidden beneath a longish black bang. But based on the equipment and profile, it had been the player who had been talking to her the moment she passed out. He must have found some way to carry her out of the dungeon into this forest. She scanned the line of trees until on her left she finally spotted a massive tower stretching upward to the roof, a few hundred feet away, the labyrinth of the first floor Einkrad. She turned back to her right, perhaps sensing her movement to the main shoulders twitch beneath the gray leather coat, and his head rose slightly. Even in the midst of the midday forest sun, his eyes were as black as a starless night. The instant she crossed gazes with those pitch-black eyes, a tiny firework went off deep in the back of her mind. You shouldn't have bothered, growled Asuna Yuki, past gritted teeth. From the moment she'd been trapped in this world, Asuna had asked herself the same questions hundreds of times, if not thousands. Why did she decide to play with that brand new gaming console when it was even her wasn't even hers? Why did she put the helmet on her head, sink into the high-backed mesh chair, and utter uh, the startup command? Asuna hadn't bought the Nerve Gear, VR interface of dreams turned cursed tool of death, or the game card Sorter Online. Vast prisons of souls. That had been her much older brother, Chido. But even he'd never been the one for video games, much less MMORPGs. As the son of a representative director of RCT, one of the biggest electronic manufacturers in the country, he underwent every kind of education necessary to be their father's successor. Everything that didn't fall under the duty was eliminated from his life. Why he became interested in nerve gear, why he chose SAO, was still a mystery to her. But, ironically, Kaochudo never got a chance to play his first video game he'd ever bought. On very day SAO launched, he was sent on a business trip overseas. At the dinner table the night before, he tried to laugh off the frustration, but she could sense that he was really disappointed. Asuna's life hadn't been quite as strict as Kaochido's, but she had little experience with games aside from free downloads on her phone. Even up to her current age, ninth grade, she was aware of the presence of online games. But the entrance exams to her high school were fast approaching, and she had no reason or motive to seek them out, supposedly. So even she had no explanation why on an afternoon, November 6, 2022, she'd slipped into her brother's vacant room, put the already prepared nerve gear on her head, and spoken link start command. The only thing she could say was that everything had changed that day. Everything had ended. Asuna locked herself inside the in-room in the town of beginnings, waiting for the ordeal to be over, but when not a single message had made its way through from the real world in two weeks, she gave up hoping for rescue from the outside. And with over a thousand players already dead of the first dungeon the game was still unbeaten, she understood that defeating the game from the inside was equally impossible. The only choice left was in how to die. She had the option for waiting for months, possibly years, within the safety of a city, but no one could guarantee that that rule of monsters could invade towns would never be broken. Asuna preferred to leave the city rather than curl up into a ball in the dark, living in fear of the future. She'd use all her instincts to fight, learn, and grow. If she ultimately ran out of steam and perished, at least she didn't spend her remaining days regretting the decision of the past, mourning her lost future. Run, thrust, and vanished, like a meteor burning through the atmosphere. Such was Asuna's mindset as she left the inn and headed out into the darkness in the wilderness. Totally ignorant of a single MMORPG term, she picked out a weapon, learned a single skill, and found her way deep into the labyrinth that no one else had successfully conquered. Finally, at four in the morning on Friday, December 2nd, the accumulation of so many battles caused her to black out with exhaustion, and 
her quest should have ended. The name Asana, carved into the monument of life beneath the black iron palace, would be struck through and everything would come close. It would have. It should have. You shouldn't have, Asana repeated. The slumping, black-haired swordsman dropped his eyes as dark as night down onto the ground. He seemed to be slightly older than she, but the surprising naivete of his gestures surprised her. A few seconds later, her original suspicion returned to cynical smile across her lips. I didn't save you, he said quietly. It was the voice of a boy, but something in disguise his actual age. Why didn't you leave me back there, then? I only wanted to save your map data. If you spent four days at the front line, you must have mapped out a good chunk of the unexplored land. It would be a waste to let that disappear. She sucked in a breath at the logic, the efficiency of his explanation. She was expecting the same answer that most people she'd met had given her. Some claptrap about the importance of life, or the need for everyone to band together. She'd been prepared to cut through all that nonsense. Verbally, of course, but the practicality of his answer left her speechless. Fine. Take it. She muttered, opening her window. She had finally gotten used to the menu system, tabbing over to access her map info and copying it to a scroll of parchment. Another button command materialized the scroll as an in-game object, and she tossed it to the man's feet. Now you've got what you wanted. So long. She'd put a hand in the grass to get to her feet, but her legs wouldn't steady. The clock in her window showed that she had been out almost a full seven hours, but her exhaustion hadn't entirely worn off yet. She still had three more rapiers, though she told herself before she'd left that she'd stay inside the tower until the last one's durability level was below half. There were still a few suspicious lurkings in the back of her mind. How had the swordsman in the gray coat managed to bring her out into the dungeon to this forest clearing? And why did he take all the, her way outside, rather than just to a nearby safe zone within the tower? They weren't worth turning back and ask him. However, so Asuna turned to her left in the direction of the black, looming labyrinth, and started off to march. Hang on, Fencer. She ignored him and kept walking. But what he said next made her stop in her tracks. You're doing all this for the purpose of beating the game, right? Not just to die in a dungeon. So why don't you come to the meeting? Meeting? She wondered out loud. The swordsman explanation reached her ears on the gentle forest breeze. There's going to be a meeting tonight at the town of Tolbana, near the tower. They're going to plan out how to beat the boss on the first floor of Labyrinth. Three. Einkred was broadly canonical in shape, so the lowest floor, therefore, was the largest. The circular floor was about six miles across, with a surface of over 30 square miles. In comparison, the city of Kawago in Saitama Prefecture home, to over 300,000, was little over 38 square miles. Because of its size, there was actually a considerable variety in terrain to be found. At the southern tip of the landmass was the Town of Beginnings, a city over half a mile across, surrounded by a semicircular wall. Outside the city were rippling plains filled with boars and wolves, as well as, as, well as insect monsters such as worms, beetles, and wasps. Across the field to the northwest was a deep forest while the northwest had swampy lowlands dotted with lakes. Beyond these regions lay mountains, valleys, and ruins, each full of appropriate assortments of monsters. At the northern end of the floor was a squat tower, 300 yards across and 300 yards tall, the first floor labyrinth. Aside from the town of beginnings, the floor was dotted with a number of other settlements of various sizes, the largest of which though only 200 yards from one end to the other, was Tolbina, a valley town crossed to the floor of Labyrinth. The first visit 
by a player to this tranquil town lined with massive windmills was three weeks after the official launch of the Sorda Online. By that time, over 1,800 players had perished. The mysterious fencer and I had left the forest, not together but an awkward distance, and passed through the northern gate of Tolbina. A purple message in the, my field of vision stating safe haven indicated that we were within town limits. Instantly, I felt the exhaustion of a long day settle into my shoulders. A sigh escaped my lips. If I felt that this bad after only leaving the town that morning, the fencer had behind me must have felt much worse. I turned back to check on her, but her knee-high boots did not falter. A few hours of sleep couldn't have erased the fatigue of three days of straight combat, so she must have been at putting on a brave front. It seemed like returning to a town ought to cause for relaxing both in mind and body. In this virtual setting, they were the same thing. But she didn't appear to have been in the mood for suggestions. Instead, I kept things short and sweet. The meeting is at the town square, four in the afternoon. The face within the hood nodded slightly, but she kept walking right past me. A slight breeze running through the valley town rippled through the cape as she passed. I briefly opened my mouth, but found nothing to say. I'd spent the last month vigorously avoiding all human contact as a solo player. I had no right to expect anyone to welcome me into open arms. The only concern I'd had was saving my own life. Strange girl, yeah? A voice muttered from behind me. I tore my gaze away from the fencer and turned around. Seems to be on death's door, but never dies. Clearly a newbie, but her moves are as sharp as steel. Who can she be? The voice, a high-pitched weedle that rose into an odd nasal whine at the end of each sentence, belonged to a slippery little player, an entire head shorter than me. Like me, she wore only cloth and leather armor. The weapons on her waist were a small claw and some throwing needles. It didn't seem like the kind of stuff that would get her out of this dangerous zone. But this person's greatest weapon did not have a blade. You know that fencer? I asked her automatically, then grimaced, anticipating her answer. Sure enough, the little woman held up a hand, all five fingers extended. I make it cheap, 500 coal. The smiling face had one very distinct feature. She'd used a cosmetic item to draw three lines on either cheek in the style of animal whiskers. Combined with her short, mousy brown curls, the overall effect was unmistakably rodent-like. I'd asked her why she chose that appearance before, but her only response was, You don't ask a girl the reason she puts on makeup, do ya? I'll tell you. For 100,000 coal! So, the answer was still a mystery. I silently swore to myself that one day I'd actually cash in a rare item and pay the exorbitant rate just to force an answer out of her. I don't feel comfortable trafficking in a girl's private information. I muttered sternly. Nee, <laughs> a good mindset to have. She said, smearingly. Argo the Rat, the first information trader in Eincrad. Chittered with laughter. Watch out. Five minutes of chatting with the rat, and she'll have worked a hundred coal out of ya. Someone had warned me once. But according to Argo, she'd never once sold a piece of information whose verification was unclear. She'd always paid a source for info she considered worth something, and only turned it into a product to sell once she'd made out sure that it was solid. It seemed clear to me that a single piece of poor intel sold for cash would ruin her reputation. So while it wasn't exactly the same as farming ingredients in dungeons and selling them to NPCs, as a business, it had its own set of perils. Although I knew my skepticism was sexist, I couldn't help but wondering why a female player would choose to dabble in such a dangerous work. But I knew that if I asked, she'd quote on me another piece of 100,000 coal. 
so I cleared my throat and asked a different question. Well, is it the usual proxy negotiation today, rather than your main business? Now, it was Argo's turn to scowl. She looked back and forth, then prodded my back with a finger, guiding me to a nearby alleyway. With the boss meeting in full two hours away, there were a few pl players milling about the town, but it seemed to be important to her that she not be overheard, probably to do something with her reputation as a guardian of secrets. Argo came by to stop me in the narrow alley and rested her back on the wall of the house, inhabited by NPC, of course, before nodding. Yeah, that's right. They'll go up 29,800 coal. 29, huh? I grimaced and shrugged. Sorry, my answer's the same no matter what the number. I'm not gonna sell. That's what I told my client, but what can he do? Argo's main business was selling information, but she used her excellent agility stat to moonlight as a messenger. Normally, she'd simply pass along a brief verbal or written message, but for the past week, she'd been a pipeline to me from someone very insistent is not downright pushy. He or she wanted to buy my Anil Blade plus 6 3S 3D. The weaponing strengthening system in SAO was relatively simple for modern MMO RPGs. There were five parameters, sharpness, quickness, accuracy, heaviness, and durability. For a price, an NPC or player blacksmith could attempt to raise a particular stat for you. The process required specific crafting material depending on the stat, and there was always a probability it would fail. This was similar to the way it worked in other games. Each time a parameter was successfully raised, the weapon name gained a plus one or plus two, and so on. But the actual statistic being affected wasn't clear until you tapped on the item properties directly. Since it would be a pain to say plus one to accuracy and plus two to heaviness, each time when trading with other players, it was common to abbreviate the information instead. Therefore, a plus four weapon with one to accuracy and two to heaviness and one to durability would be labeled as 1A2H1D. My meal blade plus six, three S, three D, increased sharpness and durability by three points each. It took quite a lot of persistence and good fortune to improve it that much on the first floor. Few players bothered to work on the blacksmithing skill, which had no bearing on your odds of survival. And despite the dwarfish appearance of the NPC blacksmiths, their actual skill was sorely disappointing. Even the base weapon uh, was a reward of extremely tough quest, so the sword's current values had to be about maximum a player could expect to find on the first floor. But it was still a starter equipment. It might pump in a few more times, but I'd find a better sword on the third or fourth floor, and the process would begin all over again. For that reason, I had a hard time fathoming the motive of Argo's client to pay the massive sum of 20,980 coal for such a weapon. In the face-to-face -face negotiations, I could simply ask the buyer without a name to track down. There was no way to find out about him. And how much are they paying you to keep quiet? A thousand? I asked. Argo nodded. Yeah, I'd say so. Feel like upping the ante? Hmm. 1K, huh? Hmm. This hush money was a fee that Mystery Bitter X was paying Argo to keep their identity hidden. If I offered to pay 1,100 coal, Argo would pass that along via instant message until they came back with 1,200 coal. Then I'd be asked to pony up 1,300 and so on. If I ended up winning the bidding war, I'd learn who wanted to buy my sword but I'd end up losing a significant amount of cash. That would clearly be an idiotic outcome. Great. 
So you're an information broker who makes money even when you don't sell? Gotta admire your dedication with the business. I grumbled. Argo's whiskered face broke into a grin, and she hissed with laughter. <laughs> That's the best part about it, see? The moment I sell the piece of intel, I've got brand new product to sell. So and so, and just bought such and such information. It's twice the profit. In real life, an attorney would never reveal the name of her client. But given the rat's motto of, all information has a price, she didn't seem to honor that t taboo. Anyone who wanted to make a deal with her needed to know beforehand that their own information could be sold. But when her product was so excellent, who can complain about the price? If any female players wanted my personal information, let me know so I can buy theirs first, I said wearily. Argo crackled again, then put on a serious expression. Okay, I'll tell the client you refused again. I'll even throw in my opinion that they won't get through to you. So long, key boy! The rat turned and waved, and then darted back out of the alley, as nimbly as her namesake. After a momentary glimpse of her brown curls vanishing into the crowd, I felt sure she'd never get herself killed. I had learned several things over the first month of SAO, the game of death. What separated a player's likelihood of life and death, there was an infinite number of variables, stock of potions, knowing when they'd leave a dungeon, and so on. But somewhere at the center of those swirling factors was the presence of a person's core, something they could believe in unconditionally. You might call it one of the greatest weapons, a tool necessary for survival. For Argo, that was information. She knew everything crucial, where dangerous monsters were and the most efficient places to hunt. That knowledge gave her confidence and a cool head, which raised her chances of survival. What was my core? It had to be the sword on my back. More precisely, it was the feeling I got when my blade and I became one. I'd only managed to reach that mental zone a few times, but it was the desire to control the power at will. To be at the unquestioned ruler of that realm, that drove me to stay alive. The reason I'd put points into sharpness and durability rather than quickness and accuracy was simple. The former were pure numerical increases, but the latter adjusted the system itself. They changed the sensation of swinging the sword. But in that case, what about the fencer on the frontier of the labyrinth? What was her core? I transported her outside the dungeon. Using means I could never tell her, but... If I hadn't been there, would she really have died? I could easily imagine her unconsciously getting to her feet as the next kobold approached, using her shooting star linear to dismatch the beast. What drove her to undergo such a ferocious string of battles? What had kept her alive up until this point? She must have had the source of strength I could imagine. Maybe I should have paid Argo for 500 coal. I muttered, and then shook my head and looked upward. The white painted windmills that were the defining symbol of Tolbana had just a tinge of orange to them. It was a bit past three o'clock, time to grab a bite to eat before the undoubtedly long and tedious boss raid meeting. When the meeting started at four, things would get ugly. Today, for the first time, one hidden fissure between SAO players would come into clarity the unbridgeable gap between new players and beta testers. There was only one piece of information that Argo the Rat refused to sell the others, and that was whether a person had been a beta tester or not. She wasn't alone in that f philosophy. All the form of testers who could recognize one another by name or voice, if not by face, intentionally avoided reaching out to each other. The previous encounter was no different. Both Argo and I knew the other other was a beta tester, but we went light years out of our way to never discuss it. The reason was simple. Being publicly outed as a beta tester could be fatal. 
Not because of monsters in the dungeon. Because if you wandered alone in a game map, you could be executed by a lynch mob of new players. They believed that deaths of 2,000 players within a month could be laid on the feet of the beta testers. And I couldn't totally deny that charge. 4. For her first meal in three or possibly even four days, Asuna chose a heel of the cheapest black bread the NPCs sold in town, as well as three free water available at many fountains around the place. She'd never particularly enjoyed eating in real life, but the total emptiness of eating in this world was hard to describe. No matter how gorgeous the feast might appear, not a single grain of sugar or salt reached her real body. It seemed to her that they should have eliminated the concept of hunger and fullness altogether. But the virtual body craved food three times a day, and the pangs did not disappear unless virtual food was eaten. She'd learned how to shut out the feeling of hunger through the sheer willpower while lurking in a dungeon. But there was no hiding the need once back in town. As an act of protest, she'd always choose the cheapest possible option. But it made her angry in a way, that even the rough black bread eaten a scrap at a time actually tasted pretty good. Asuna was sitting on a simple wooden bench, next to the fountain square at the center of Tobana, chewing away with her food pulled low. For the only costing a single coal, the bread was fairly large. She just finished half of it, Pretty good, isn't it? Voice came from her right. Her fingers stopped in the act of ripping another piece free. She'd, th she'd threw a sharp glare in that direction. It was the man she'd left behind at the town's entrance a few minutes ago. The black-haired swordsman in a gray coat. The meddlesome stranger who'd somehow transported her unconscious body outside the dungeon, keeping her journey going when it should have ended. Her cheeks suddenly grew hot at the thought. After all of her bold statements about dying, not only was she alive, but she'd been her chowing down on a meal. Her entire being was racked with shame, and she froze with the crescent of bread in her hands, uncertain of how to respond. The man eventually coughed politely and asked, May I sit next to you? Normally, she would silently stand up and leave without a second's glance. But in this unfilm, unfamiliar situation, she was at a loss. Taking Asuna's lack of response as silent permission, he sat down at the far right corner of the bench and rummaged in his pocket, giving her as much space as possible. When his hand reappeared, it was holding a round black object, a one coal roll of black bread. For an instant, Asuna forgot her shame and confusion and looked that up at him at simple astonishment. If he was good enough to have reached that deep a spot in the labyrinth, and have such excellent equipment, this swordsman must have enough money to afford a full course meal at a nice restaurant. Was he just a cheapskate, or do you really think it tastes good? She asked. Before she could stop herself, his eyebrows took an expression of hurt and dignity and he nodded vigorously. Of course, I've eaten one every day since I got to this town. Of course, I throw on a little wrinkle. Wrinkle? She tilted her head in confusion, beneath the hood. Rather than explain out loud, the swordsman reached into his pocket and produced a small porcelain jar. He set it down on the vents between them. Use this on your bread. For a moment, she wasn't sure what he meant by use this on the bread, then realized that it was a common video game phrase. Use the key on the door, use the bottle on the spring, and so on. She reluctantly reached out and touched the lid of the jar with a fingertip. She selected use on the pop-up menu that appeared, and her finger started glowing purple, the signal for target selection mode. By touching the black bread on the left hand, her objects would interact. With a brief jingle, the bread was suddenly white, coated 
No, covered with a thick substance that appeared to be cream. Where did you get this? It was a reward for the revenge of the cow's quest in the last town. It takes a long time to beat, so I don't think many people have bothered to finish it. He said, seriously, using the jar on his bread with a particular motion, it must have been the last of the container because the jar flashed, tinkled, and disappeared. He opened his mouth wide and took a large bite of his cream-slathered bread. His chewing was so vigorous that she could pop practically hear the sound effect, and Asuna realized that the first time in ages, her stomach pains were not an unpleasant pain, but the healthy sign of honest hunger. She took a hesitant bite of the creamy bread in her hand. Suddenly, the rough, dry bread she'd been eating had turned into a heavy, rustic cake. The cream was sweet and smooth, with a refreshing ta tartness like yogurt. Asuna took a few more rapturous bites, her cheeks packed full with numbing sense of contentment. The next thing she knew, there was not a single crumb left of the item in her hand. She looked over with a start to see that she'd finished her food just two seconds before the swordsman. Overcome with shame again, she'd wanted to get up and run off, but couldn't bring herself to be so rude to the man who just treated her to a tasty meal. Breathing heavily, attempting to get her mind in order, Asuna managed to squeak out a polite response. Thanks for the food. You're welcome. Done with his meal, the swordsman clapped his fingerless, gloved hands together and continued. If you want to do that cow quest I mentioned, there's a trick to it. If you're efficient, you can beat it in just two hours. She couldn't deny the temptation. With that yogurt cream, her cheap black bread turned into a proper feast. It was only artificial satisfaction created by the game's flavor modeling system. But she wanted it again. Every day, if possible. But, Asin looked down quietly and shook her head. I'll pass. I didn't come to this town in order to eat food. I see. Why, then? While the swordsman's voice wasn't particularly melodious, there was a boy's inflection to it that was not displeased to her ears in the least. It was perhaps this feature that led her to speak on what was on her mind, something that she had, hasn't done with anyone else in the world. So that I can be myself. If I was going to just hide back in the first city and waste away, I'd rather be myself until the very last moment, even if it means dying at the hands of a monster. I don't want to let this game beat me. I won't let it happen. The 15 years of Asuna Yuki's life had been a long series of battles. It had started with the entrance exam to kindergarten and followed with an endless succession of tests, big and small. She'd beaten them all. Losing in a single instance would mean that her life was no longer any worth. She'd successfully shouldered that pressure since the very start. But after 15 years of winning, this test, Sword Art Online, would likely be the end of her. It was too mysterious to her. A culture steeped in foreign, unfamiliar rules. And it was not the kind of battle that she could be won alone. The only means of victory was reaching the very top of the giant floating craft castle, a full hundred floors above, and beating the final enemy. But a month after the start of the game, one-fifth of the players were already gone, and most of them were experienced in the way of these things. The forces left behind were too weak, and the path ahead was very, so very long. As though the faucet holding her innermost feelings had been opened the tiniest bit, the words trickled drop by drop out of her mouth. The confession came in fragments, pieces of logic that didn't add up to full sentences. But the black-haired swordsman sat and listened in silence. When the asana's voice had died away in the evening breeze, he finally spoke. I'm sorry. A few seconds later... Asuna skeptically wondered why he would say that. She'd only met him today, 
He had no reason to apologize to her. She'd peered to her right and saw that he was hunched over on a bench, those elbows on his knees. His lips shifted, and more faint words reached her ears. I'm sorry, this current situation. The reason you feel so pressured is my... But she couldn't make out the rest. The especially large windmill in the center of town started ringing its wind-powered clock bell. It was four o'clock, the time of the meeting. She looked up and saw that a large number of players had gathered across the fountain square. Let's go. You invited me to this meeting, after all, Asinus said, getting to her feet. He nodded and slowly rose. What was he going to say? It ultimately didn't matter because she was never going to speak with him again, but the thought dug into her side like a tiny thorn. I want to know. I don't want to know. Even Asana didn't know which desire was stronger. 5. 44. That was the number of players who gathered at the fountain in Tobana. I had to admit... It was well below my expectations, my hopes. An official party in SAO could be up to six players. At a throng of eight of those, 48 people in total was a full-size raid party. My experience in the beta had taught me that the best way to tackle a floor boss without any casualties was a two raid party trading off, but this wasn't even enough for one. I sucked in a deep breath for a sigh, but held it in when a voice came from behind me. There are so many. It was the fencer in the hooded cape. I turned and shot back. Many? You call this many? Yes, uh, I mean, they're all here for the first attempt at this floor's boss, right? Knowing that they could all die in the process. I see. I nodded and gazed around at the small groups of fighters huddled around the, uh, the town square. There were five or six players I knew by name, and another fifteen or so familiar faces I'd come across along the frontier. The remaining twenty or something were all new to me. Naturally, the gender balance was extremely uneven. As far as I could tell, the fencer was the only woman in the group, but with her hood pulled so low, it wasn't quite apparent, and I was certain that anyone else observing would assume it was all men. Across the square, Argo the Rat was perched upon a high wall, but she would not take part in the battle. The fencer was right. There were, they were all going to face the first floor boss, an enemy no one had seen before, at least in the official Eingrad. Of all the battles one could tackle on the first floor, this would carry the highest risk of death. That meant every player here was prepared for the possibility of death in order to serve as a stepping stone for those who came after them. However, I'm... I'm not so sure, I muttered. She turned to me, her eyes flashing doubtfully within the hood. I chose my words carefully. I don't think it applies to everyone, but I think it's a fair number of them that aren't doing this out of self-sacrifice, but because they just don't want to be left in the dust. If anything, I'd be one of the latter myself. Left in the dust? Behind what? Behind the frontier. The thought of dying is frightening, but so is the idea that the boss is defeated without you. The cloth hood dipped slightly. I figured that, being a total beginner at MMOs, she wouldn't understand what I was saying. But I was wrong. Is that the same kind of motivation? Like when you don't want to fall below the top 10 of the class, or you want to stay above the 17th percentile, or, or whatever. Now it was my turn to lose my voice. Eventually, I agreed. Yeah, um, I think so. The shapely lips visible through the hood crinkled into a tiny smile, and I heard a few quiet, quiet snorts of breath. Was she laughing? The wielder of that ultra-precise linear who told me to mind my own business when I brought her out of the dungeon? I almost about to rudely stare directly under the hood. But 
I was saved from that faux pas by the sound of a loud clapping and a shout that echoed across the square. All right, people. It's five minutes past already, so let's get this started. Gather round, folks. You there. Three steps closer. The speaker was a swordsman, clad in glimmering metal armor. He leapt nimbly up onto the lip of the fountain at the center of the square from a standing position. A single jump that height wearing heavy armor made it clear that he had excellent strength and agility. Some within the crowd of forty-odd began to stir when he turned to survey the group. It made sense. The man standing on the lip of the fountain was so brilliantly handsome that he had to wonder why he had bothered playing VR MMO in the first place. On top of that, the wavy locks framing his face were dyed a brilliant blue. Hair dye wasn't sold at NPC vendors on the first floor, so he must have gotten it as a rare drop from a monster. If he'd gone to all this trouble just to look good in front of a crowd, I assume he must be disappointed, given that there was only one woman in the group, and it wasn't clear that she was one given the hood. But the man flashed a dashing smile that suggested that he would never stoop to think such a thing. Thank you all for heeding my call today. I'm sure some of you know me already, but just in case... My name is Diavel, and I like to think of myself playing a knight. The closest of the fountain started jeering and whistling, and someone cried, I bet you wanted to say that you're just playing a hero! There were no official character classes in Sword Art Online. Every player had a number skill, slots, and they were free to choose which skills to equip in advance. As an example... Players who focus on crafting or trading skills might be referred to as blacksmiths, tailors, or cooks, but I'd never heard of anyone called a knight or a hero. Then again, if someone wanted to be known at, by that title, that was their prerogative. Diavel had bronze armor on his chest, shoulders, arms, and shins, as well as a longsword on his waist, and a kite shield on his back. Added up, that they certainly made up a proper knight's outfit. Watching his proud display from the back row, I quickly consulted my memory. The equipment and the hair were different, so it was hard to tell. But I could have sworn I'd seen that face a few times in towns around the first floor. What about before other Einkrad? I didn't recognize the name. Now, you're all top players in the game, active around the front line of our progress, and I hardly need to remind you of why we're here. Diavel's speech continued. I stopped trying to remember and focus on his words. The blue-haired knight raised a hand and gestured to a massive tower, the labyrinth of the first floor, outside the town limits. Today, our party discovered the staircase that leads to the top of that tower, which means that either tomorrow or the day after, we will finally reach the first floor boss chamber. The crowd stirred. I was surprised as well. The first floor labyrinth was 20 level tower, and I, and the fencer, had been around just around the start of the 19th level today. I had no ideas that others had mapped out so much of that floor already. One month. It took an entire month. But we still have to be an example. We have to beat the boss, reach the second floor, and show everyone in the town of beginnings that someday we can beat this game of death. That is the duty of all top-level players here. Isn't that right? Another cheer rose. Now, it wasn't Diavel's friend, but others in the crowd who applauded. What he said was noble and without fault. In fact, anyone seeking fault in it had to be crazy. I decided the knight who stood up and took on the role of uniting the scattered players at the frontier deserved some applause from me. When... Just a sec, sir knight, the voice said calmly. The cheers stopped, and people at the front stepped aside. Standing in the middle of an open space was a short but solid man. All I could see from my position was a large sword and a spiky brown hair that conjoined in the image of a cactus. The cactus took a step forward and growled in a rasp totally unlike Diavel's smooth voice. Gotta get this off of my chest before we can play pretend friends. Diavel didn't bat an eye at this sudden interruption. 
He beckoned to the squat man with a confident smile. What is on your mind, friend? I'm open to opinions. If you're going to offer yours, however, I'd ask you to introduce yourself first. Hmm. The cactus-headed man snorted and took a few steps forward until he was right in front of the fountain and then turned to the crowd. My name is Cabal. The spiky-haired swordsman with a fierce name glared out at the gathering with a small but piercing eyes. As they swept sideways, I had the fleeting impression that they stopped on my face for a moment. But I'd never heard his name and didn't remember meeting him before. After his lengthy survey of the gathering, Cabal growled again. There gotta be five or ten folk in the midst that owe an apology first. Apology? To whom? Diavel the knight, still standing on the edge of the fountain behind him, grandly gestured with both hands. Cabal spat angrily, not bothering to turn around. Ha! Ain't it obvious? The two thousand people who already died. Two thousand people died because they hogged everything to themselves. Ain't that right? The murmuring crowd of forty or so suddenly went dead silent. They finally understood what Cabal was trying to say. I did too. The only sound through the heavy silence was the distant strains of the NPC musicians playing the evening BGM. No one said a word. Everyone seemed to understand that if he spoke up, he would be branded as one of them. It was certainly that fear which gripped my mind at the moment. Mr. Cabal, when you refer to them, I assume you mean the former beta testers, asked Diavel. Arms crossed, a look of grave severity on his face. Obviously, Cabal said to the knight behind him with a glance. The thick scale mail sued to a leather frame jangling as he turned. The day this goddamn game started, all of them beta testers uh, ran oh, straight out of the first town. They abandoned 9,000 folks who didn't know right from left. They monopolized the best hunting spots, profitable quests, so they could level up and didn't spare a backwards glance for no one. I know there must be more in one than two in standing here right now, thinking they can get in this boss action without anyone knowing. If they don't get down on their hands and knees to apologize and donate their stockpile of coal and items for the cause of fighting this boss, I ain't gonna put my life in their hands. Is what I'm saying. Just as the kibba in his name, used for Fang, suggested, he ended it with a snarl and bared teeth. Unsurprisingly, no one spoke up. As a former beta tester myself, I clenched my teeth and held my breath and didn't make a sound. It wasn't as though I didn't want to shout back at him to ask him if he thought no beta testers had died yet. A week earlier, I bought a piece of intel from Argo. Technically, I had her look into something for me. I wanted a total of dead beta testers. The SAO closed beta, which ran during the summer vacation, only a thousand open slots. Every member also got an exclusive first rights to buy the official package edition when it released. Based on the number of people who logged in at the end of the beta, I estimated that not every person was going to keep playing when the game released. It would probably be seven or eight hundred. That was my guess, as the total number of beta testers present at the start of the game of death. Finding out who was a beta tester was the tricky part. If there was a B mark next to the player's cursor, that would clear up the matter for once. But fortunately, that was not the case, and physical appearances was not a factor either. As the GM Akihito Kayaba had ensured that every player was now modeled after their own real-life appearance, the only hint to go on was a player's name, but many of them could have changed their names between the beta and the full release. The reason Argo and I recognized each other as beta testers had to do with the circumstances of our first meeting, but that's a story for another time. At any rate, Argo's investigation should have been incredibly hard, yet she came back to me with a number, just after three days. 
In her estimation, the total number of beta testers who were now dead was about 300. If that figure was correct, it meant that 2,000 dead, 1,700 were new players. Put into percentages, that meant the death rate of new players was 18%, but the death rate of beta testers was closer to 40. Knowledge and experience did not always translate to safety. At times, they could be one's downfall. I myself nearly died on my very first quest I followed after the game of death began. There were external factors as well. The terrain, items, monsters were virtually the same in the finished game as in the beta test, but the slightest little difference could pop up, as small as a deadly as a poison needle. May I speak? A rich, baritone voice echoed throughout the evening square. I looked up with a start to see a silhouette proceeding from the left end of the gathering. He was large, easily over six feet tall. The avatar's size was supposed to have no effect on stats, but he made the two-handed battle axe strapped to his back look light. His face was just about as menacing as the weapon. His scalp was completely bald and chocolate brown, but the chiseled features of his face fit that bold look quite well. He didn't even look Japanese. For all I knew, maybe he was of a different race. As the burly man reached at the edge of the fountain, he turned and bowed to the crowd of forty before turning his attention to the woeful outsized cabal. My name is Agil, and if I have this right, cabal, you're claiming that many newbies died because the former beta testers did not help them, and therefore they ought to apologize and pay reparations. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Cabal was momentarily taken back, but he recovered and stood straight up glaring back at the axe warrior Agil with his glinting eyes. If they didn't abandon the rest of us, that 2,000 wouldn't be dead right now. And that ain't just 2,000 random folks. That's the best of the best from other MMOs we, that we lost. Those beta assholes had the decency to share their loot and knowledge. We'd have 10 times as many folks here. In fact, we'd be on the second or third floor by now. 300 of the people you are mourning are those assholes, jerk. I wanted to yell, but I held back the impulse. I didn't have any proof backing up that number. And in more self-centered terms, I just didn't want to be singled out. This much was clear. Outing myself as a former beta tester could not possibly help my situation. The four or five hundred testers left were hiding among the players new to the game. In terms of level and equipment, they likely weren't any different from other top players. But if I stood up and revealed my background, not only would I fail to smooth over tensions between the two groups, it would probably just end with a witch hunt. The worst possible outcome was infighting between new players and testers among the elite players in the frontier. We had to avoid that outcome at all costs, whether in the fields or in the dungeon. The outdoor areas of SAO were free reign for attacking other players. So you claim, Cabal. While I can't argue with the loot, we've certainly had in the information out there. Agile spoke in his rich baritone. While I hung my head pathetically, he reached into the pouch of the waist of the leather armor stretched over his rippling muscles and produced a simple book made of bound sheets of parchment. On the cover was a simple rat icon with rounded ears and three whiskers on either sides. You got one of these guidebooks too, didn't you? They were handing them out for free at the item shops in Harunka and Medai. For free? I muttered. As the icon of the cover suggested, it was a guide to the area that Argo the Rat sold to other players. It contained detailed maps and lists of monsters, their item drops, and even quest information. The large splash text on the lower half of the cover said, Don't worry, this is Argo's guidebook. Wasn't just a cheeky bit of fluff. Admittedly, I'd bought the entire set myself to keep my memory fresh. But from what I recalled, they went for a hefty price of 500 coal a book. But what the hell? The rat, a scheming dealer who would sell her own status numbers for the right price, giving away information for free? It was unthinkable. I shot a glance back at the stone wall where she'd been sitting minutes ago, 
but there was no one there. I made a mental note to ask her the reason the next time I saw her, then recognized when I heard her voice inside my head saying, That'll cost you about a thousand, Dig. Yeah, I got one. What of it? Kibal snarled, bringing me back to the present scene. Agile put the strategy guide back in his pouch and crossed his arms. Every time I reached a new town or village, there was always one of those books at the item shop. Same for you, right? Didn't it strike you as too quick for the information to have been compiled already? What's the point if it's too quick? I mean, that's the only people who could have offered this information, and the map data for the informer are the informer beta testers. The crowd stirred. Cabal's mouth shut, and Diavel the knight nodded in agreement. Algeal looked toward the group and spoke in his loud baritone. Listen, the information was out there, and yet the people still died. I'm thinking it's because they were veteran MMO players. They assumed SAO worked on the same principles and standards as other titles, failed to pull back when they needed to. But now is not the time for, to be holding anyone responsible for this. It seems to me that this meeting is going to determine whether we meet the same fate or not. Agile, the axe warrior's tone was bold, but reasonable. In his argument, was so sound that Cabal had no immediate retort. If anyone other than Agile had argued the same thing, Cabal would likely have accused him from being a beta tester. But in this case, he could only stare at daggers at large men behind the two silent debaters. Standing on the edge of the fountain was his long flowing hair, almost purple in the light of the setting sun. Diavel nodded magnanimously. Your point is well taken, Cabal. I myself died several occasions due to my ignorance on the wilderness. But as Agile says, isn't this the time to look forward? If we're going to beat the four boss, we'll even need the form of beta testers. No, especially need the form of beta testers. If we exclude them and get wiped out, then what is the point of it all? It was a sweeping switch, then more than worthy of a noble knight. Many in the crowd nodded in agreement, as the mood seemed to tilt forward uh, forgiveness for the testers. I sighed with relief, and not a small amount of shame. Diavel continued, I am sure you all have your own thoughts on the matter, but for now, I would like your help in clearing the first floor. If you simply can't bear the thought of fighting alongside a beta, beta tester, then we'll miss you. But I won't force you to participate. Teamwork is the most important part of any raid. His gaze slowly swept across the crowd until it fixed on Cabal. The cactus-headed swordsman met the gaze for several long moments. Then he snorted loudly and growled. Fine, I'll play along for now. But once the boss fight's over, we're gonna settle this once and for all. He turned, scale mail rattling, and walked back to the front row of the crowd. Agile spread his hands, signaling he had nothing else to say, and turned to his spot. In the end, this scene was the highlight of the meeting. There were only so much detailed planning that could be done for a battle when we just only reached the floor the creature was on. How does anyone plan a boss fight when no one else has seen it yet? Well, that wasn't quite true. I knew that the first floor boss was an enormous kobold, and that he swung a huge talwar, and that he was accompanied by a retinue of about 12 heavily armored kobolds. If I revealed that I was a former beta tester and offered my knowledge of the boss, our odds of success might rise. But if I did that, people would ask why I hadn't spoken before, and it might inflame the undercurrent of anger against the testers again. Plus, my knowledge was only of the previous incarnations of Einkrad, and there was always the possibility that the release version of SAO had redesigned and rebalanced the boss. If we formulated a plan based on the beta information and charged into the room only to find it that it had been different appearance and pattern of attack, the ensuing confusion would be at the downfall of the raid. Ultimately, until someone opened the door to the boss chamber and got him to pop into the world, we couldn't begin to plan. This was the excuse I told myself. 
to hold my silence. At the end of the meeting, Diovell led an optimistic cheer and got the rest of the gathering to shout in approval. I raised the fish, fist in solidarity, but the fencer beside me did not even pull a hand out of her cape, much less join the cheer. She turned around to leave before the call of the dismissed rang out. Before she went, she spoke in a whisper that I could only hear. Whatever you are about to say before the meeting, tell me if we both survive the battle. As she headed into the dim alley, I silently answered, Yes, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I left everything else behind for the sake of keeping myself alive. Six. There was no discussion of any strategic merit at the boss meeting, but it apparently served the value of purpose of bolstering morale, as the 20th level of the labyrinth was mapped with unprecedented speed. On Saturday, December 30th, the day after the meeting, the first party, again, Diavel's band of six, discovered double doors with the boss team. I knew when it happened because I was also solo adventuring nearby and heard the cheers. Boldly enough, they opened the door to catch a glimpse of a resident within. At the fountainside meeting in Tolbana that evening, the blue-haired knight proudly announced his findings. The boss was an enormous kobold that towered over six feet tall. His name was Ilfang, the kobold lord. His weapon fell into the curved blade category. He was attended by three ruined cobalt sentinels with metal armor and halberds. This much was the same as the beta. From what I recalled, the sentinels respawned with each of the four stages of the boss's HP bar, making a total of 12 over the course of the battle. But as usual, I didn't have the guts to say this out loud. It would become as clear as they tried the few test skirmishes, I told myself. As it turned out, I need to have the worry, because something cleared it up all in the mind midst of the meeting. Coincidentally, the NPC shop stall in the corner of the fountain square began selling a very familiar item. Three sheets of parchment bound together with, with more pamphlet than a book. It was Argo's first floor boss guidebook. Price, zero coal. The meeting was temporarily adjourned so that everyone could purchase a copy from the NPC and pour over the contents. As usual, the amount of information was impressive. The first three pages were stuffed with all manner of detail. Just revealed the boss's name, estimated HP, the reach and speed of his talwar, damage, even sword skill. The fourth page covered with accompanying kobold sentinels, including a note that they spawned four times, making a total of twelve. On the rear cover of the book was a message in a red font that had not been present in any of Argo's other guides. It read, This information is from the SAO beta test. Details may not match the current version of the game. When I saw this, I looked up, searching for Argo around the square. But I saw no sign of the rat or her plain leather armor today. I looked back down and murmured, She's really going out on a limb. This red warning was going to topple Argo's usual stance of this information I bought from some beta testers. Identity unknown. Anyone who read this warning would suspect that the rat herself was a former tester. There was no proof, of course. But with the widening gap of sentiment between the new players and beta testers, she was clearly putting herself at risk of being a first hunted down. On the other hand, it was clear that this guidebook would remove the need for tiresome and dangerous scouting missions. Once all 40 plus players had finished reading, they looked once again to the blue haired knight standing on the lip of the fountain, as though putting their decision in the hands of the leader. Diavel's head stayed down for many long seconds, deep in thought, before he finally straightened up and addressed the crowd. Let us be grateful for this information, my friends, the cloud murmured. This was clearly a call for peace with the beta testers, rather than antagonism. I thought Cabal might leap up in protest, but the brown cactus hair never near the front gathering stayed firmly in place. Regardless of its source, this guide was going to save us two or three days of scouting out the boss. 
I'm actually quite grateful for this. It's the reconnaissance mission that carry the greatest risk of fatalities, after all. Heads of various colors nodded throughout the square. If these figures are correct, the boss's numerical stats are too dangerous. If SAL was a normal MMO, we could probably take it out within an average of level 3, no, 5 levels below the enemy. So, if we work out our tactics and come equipped with plenty of pots for healing, it should be possible to win without any deaths. No, let me rephrase that. We are not going to have any deaths, period. On my pride as a knight, I swear this to you. Someone in the crowd raised a cheer, and a round of applause followed. Even as a twisted solo, I had to admit that Diavels had a gift of leadership. The guild function didn't unlock until the third floor, but he would certainly have his own on the day we reached that far. My breath caught in my throat at the next words. All right, now I think it's time to actually start planning out the battle. After all, we can't start talking, taking roles until we've formed a proper raid party. First off, form into parties with your friends and others around you. What? He sounded like a PE teacher at an elementary school. I did some quick calculations. A full party of an SAO was six members, and there were 44 present, so that made seven parties with two left over. Should we shoot for an average, but have our four parties of six and four parties of five? But that was unlikely to happen on its own if our leader didn't make the order. All of my high-speed thinking went to waste. In less than a minute from Diavel's suggestion, there were seven full parties of six members. Obviously, he had his own party of six, but didn't expect a lone wolves like Cabal and Ajeel to find their own grouplings so fast. I began to wonder if I was seriously the one person who didn't receive some kind of invitation, But I wasn't. After a quick scan of the crowd, I spotted a familiar hooded cape standing slightly apart from the rest, and slipped over to her side. So, uh, you got left out too, eh? I asked, only to be greeted with a stare like molten steel. She muttered again an angry response. I'm not a cast-off. I just didn't want to butt in, because it seemed like everyone else already had their own friends. I wisely decided not to point out that she had perfectly defined a cast-off, and put on a serious face instead. Why don't you just team up with me, then? A raid goes up to eight parties, and it's the only way we can practice. Basing my suggestions on the properties of the game systems was a success. As she looked briefly hesitant, then snorted and said, I might consider it if you send me an invite. Since retorting, it was my idea first, so you should send the invite, was a kind of childishness that I'd grown out of since being trapped here in the last month. I nodded obediently and tapped the fencer's cursor, lending a party invite. She accepted flippantly, and a second, smaller HP gauge appeared on the top left of my field of vision. I stared at the list of letters below the bar. Asana. That was the name of the strange fencer, with a pretensual swift linear. Diavel the knight's leadership was not limited to his speech-making. He exclaimed each of the seven full parties that had been informed, within a minimum of switching members, had tweaked them into distinct groups with their own purpose in battle. There were two heavily armored tank squads, three groups of attackers with high offensive power, and two support teams armed with longer range weapons. The two tank squads would switch off, pulling aggro from the Cobalt Lord, absorbing his attacks and attention. Two of the attack teams would focus on the boss, while the third was in charge of holding off his followers. The support teams, equipped with long, shafted weapons, would employ delaying and interrupting skills as much as possible to prevent the enemies from attacking. I thought it was a good arrangement, simple and less likely to fall apart. The knight returned my esteem by examining the leftover party, the fencer and I, of course, for a long few moments before offering some pleasant advice. Can you folks back up Team E to make sure none of the roaming cobalts get through? 
translated. It felt like he was asking if we could hang out near the back and not get anyone in anyone's way. I could sense the fencer named Asuna preparing to make a very unfriendly gesture, so I held my hand in front of her and smiled. Got it. Uh, that's an important role. You can count on us. Thanks a lot. The knight flashed his pearly whites and returned to the fountain. An angry voice hissed in my ear. How is that important? We're not going to get a single hit on the boss before he dies. Well, what else can you do? There's only two of us. We can't even switch in as long as the enough pot rotations. Switch? Pot? At her mistrustful murmuring, I stopped to consider. She had left the town's of beginnings as an absolute newbie with no prior experiences and made it this far on her own, using nothing more than a bundle of five baseline rapiers bought from an NPC at the sword skill linear. I'll explain everything later. It'll take too long to go over right here. I figured there was more likely a chance she'd shoot back that she didn't even know anyways, but to my surprise, she was silent for several moments before nodding, me nodding meekly. The second meeting of the boss strategy committee ended with a quick greetings from the leaders of the team, A through G, and an official disruption distribution plan for the cash and items. The boss would drop the large axe warrior agile was a team leader of tank team B, while the antagonistic cabal led attack team E. The team E was the group assigned to stop roving kobolds, so the leftovers, it was our job to assist cabal. I didn't really want anything to do with him, but he didn't actually know that I was a former beta tester. For now. In the end, Argo the Rat never showed up to the meeting. I was going to blame her, of course. Her guidebook was more than helpful. The cold dropped by the boss would be automatically split evenly between all 40 members of the raid, and the items were on a simple finder's keepers basis. Contemporary MMOs had transitioned into a system which players could select to claim an item and roll a dice to see who would win it, but SAO chose to be a more primitive method. The items would automatically drop into the player's storage, and no one would be any other wiser. In other words, if the group decided that all items from the boss should be distributed by dice rolls, all players would have to voluntarily give up those items to the lottery first. As I knew from my personal experience in the beta, this was a sore test of one's willpower. Several times I'd experienced the nasty breakup of a party when no one stepped forward with the loot after a big fight, meaning that someone must be lying about their gains. It was likely Diavel intend to prevent this unsavory outcome by enacting the Finder's Keepers rule. Our considerate knight in shining armor. At 5.30, the day before we closed with a cheer, and the gathering broke apart into small groups to find pubs and restaurants to visit. I rolled my shoulders, which seemed unnaturally stiff, wondering if it was just an illusion or some kind of actual physical tension that was bleeding through the virtual world. So, where will you be giving me this explanation? I wondered what she was talking about for a moment, and spun around in a nervous surprise. Oh, uh, I can talk to you anywhere you like. How about a pub around here? No, I don't want anyone seeing. I was briefly stung by her implication, but recovered my pride by choosing to interpret her meaning as seen with a man, rather than seen with me. Okay... Uh, how about an NPC's house? But still, someone could wander in. We could get a room at the inn so we could lock the door. But that's obviously out. Of course it is. This time, I suffered piercing damage from that retort, which was as sharp as the end of her rapier. I could manage a conversation with female players because this was a virtual world, but... Just a month before, I had been terribly awkward and antisocial middle schooler who, had who could barely talk to his own sister. Wasn't I supposed to be sticking to my guns about a solo player? Why was in I in this situation in the first place? Obviously, I would, wouldn't be any use in a boss battle without joining a group, 
But the other seven groups were all men, so I'd have felt much less awkward if I just worked my way into them instead. As my mind ran even ever more self-pitting circles, the fencer sighed and continued. Besides, the inn rooms in this place barely live up to the name. They're like tiny boxes with a bed and table, and they expect you to pay 50 coal a night. I don't care about food, but the sleep you need is real, so they could at least give us a better accommodations. Huh, you think so? I asked, surprised. You know, there are places available if you search them out, right? They just cost a little more. How hard do you have to search? There's only three inns in the town. They're all the same. I finally understood. Oh, I see. You only check the places with the big inn signs, right? Well, isn't that self-explanatory? An inn is an inn. Yeah, but that only refers to the cheapest possible places to spend the night here on the ground floor. The inns aren't the only place uh, you to pay coal for a room. Her lips suddenly pursed. Well, why didn't you say that earlier? She sought back. I knew that I had the upper hand now, so I proudly described my favorite spot in town. I stay in the second floor of a farm town. 480 a night, but it comes with all the milk you want, and it has a comfy, spacious bed and a nice view, not to mention the bath. At that last phrase, she struck. With the speed of a linear I'd seen deep in the dungeon, her hand leapt out and grabbed the collar of my gray coat, almost hard enough to set me off the anti-crime code. Her voice was steel and menacing. What did you just say?' 